Specialty Stories, session number one. Whether you are a pre-med or a medical student, you've answered the calling to become a physician. Soon you'll have to start deciding what type of medicine you will want to practice. This podcast will tell you the stories of specialists from every field to give you the information you need to make sure you make the most informed decision possible when it comes to choosing your specialty. My name is Dr. Ryan Gray, and in this podcast, we are going to talk to a lot of people, a lot of physicians to be exact. I want to use this podcast to help you, the medical student and the pre-med student, figure out what is out there for you in the future. I know as you entered your medical career, you had the great aspirations of helping people and loving science. I think that's what everybody says when they enter medicine. They love to help people and they love science, and so they're marrying the two and want to be a physician. Many students go into medical school thinking they're interested in one thing, and then after being exposed to all of the different aspects of medicine, they come out thinking about something else. I was one of those students that went in to medical school knowing I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. That was all that I wanted to do. And I came out of medical school knowing that orthopedic surgery was still right for me. Unfortunately, the Air Force had different plans for me. And you can hear my story. I've told my story on the pre-mid years podcast, which is part of the Med Ed Media Network, which is what this podcast, the Specialty Stories podcast, is on, the Med Ed Media Network. You can find all of our shows at mededmedia.com. That's M-E-D-E-D media.com. So go check out the pre-med years. I've told my story about going to medical school, taking the HPSP scholarship from the Air Force, and having them tell me they don't want me to be an orthopedic surgeon. So even though I went through medical school, went to medical school, went through medical school, and never wavered on wanting to be an orthopedic surgeon, I ultimately didn't practice orthopedics. But that's my story, and I may tell that more in this podcast. But this podcast is here to tell the stories of other physicians, and the stories that they are going to share with us are going to shed some light into how you, the pre-med and medical student, can start formulating your own thoughts about what specialty you may want to practice in the future. We're going to talk to every specialty out there. We're going to talk to community physicians, academic physicians, women physicians, and male physicians from every specialty. We're going to try to get them all on to give different perspectives, different points of view, what led them to their career, their specialty, what traits they find good specialists in their specialty, what, what traits those specialists have, what, what they think traits in them led them to their specialty, what a typical day looks like, so on and so forth. Tons of great questions, I think. And if you have uh, any other questions maybe that you want me to add to the mix, ultimately... I want to be able to have you listen to episode one, episode two, episode three, and be able to compare them using a very set and and pretty standard set of questions so that you can really compare and contrast and, and not just have random conversations. So if you have questions that you think I should be asking, email me, ryan at medicalschoolhq.net. This podcast I'm hoping will be a weekly podcast, but I have a feeling that it's going to be harder to get interviews with different physicians to fill a weekly podcast. If you followed any of my other podcasts, and this is my fourth one, my other three podcasts have been weekly. The Pre-Med Years has been out for four plus years as we're recording this. Old Pre-Meds has been out for a year weekly. haven't missed an episode yet. And the MCAT podcast has been out for a couple months now and is a weekly podcast as well. But those shows don't require me to speak to someone every week and and have somebody else that I'm talking to and interview every single week. So this podcast is going to be a little bit harder 
to keep on a weekly basis. So if I miss a week or two here or there, don't worry, I'm still ticking and I'll get episodes out as often as I can. And so as as we progress, I may try to ratchet back and, and maybe promise one episode every other week versus hoping I get one out every week. But that's neither here nor there. I know you want to dive right in. The podcast episode, let me just tell you for a second, I'm excited not just for you, the pre-med and medical student listening to this, I'm excited for me to to talk to all of these specialists and to hear different specialties that maybe I didn't even know existed. Today's podcast is an example of that, speaking to a dermatopathologist. My name is Michelle Kathleen Heary, MD, and I also have a master's in science, and I practice dermatology and certified in dermatopathology, anatomic pathology. So I do um, clinical dermatology as well as dermatopathology. So I have my own solo practice in the community. When did you know you wanted to be a dermatologist? I wanted for so long to do something totally different. And it wasn't until really my fourth year of medical school that I knew I wanted to do derm and dermatopathology. For the longest time, I was going to be a trauma surgeon. <laughs> so it's like a huge shift <laughs> to from that to where I am now. And what, what led yeah. you to make that shift? Um, I realized, you know, once you get into to medical school and you, you know, do your third year and, and you get into the clinicals and you're on the wards, um, that it's not this, you know, image that you had when you were growing up and you wanted to be a doctor for so long. And, and it's just not that idealistic picture that you had in your head. And you sort of have to balance what you want um, professionally with a, you know, with, with a life. And I realized if I wanted to become a surgeon, uh, a trauma surgeon at that, that um, that would be my life. And even though I had told myself, you know, I want to devote my entire life and I won't get married, I won't have kids because I want to be a trauma surgeon. Once you actually get there, you realize that may not be the best life. And maybe I do want to get married. Maybe I do want to have kids. And sometimes, you know, you have to make that decision. A lot of, there are a lot of surgeons that are moms and, and wives, but I knew for me, I, I don't think that it would have worked out. And that, that's unfortunate that women have to choose sometimes, um, which path they want to take. But in the end, you know, I decided, you know, this is probably the best route for me. I have a great, you know, work-life balance. And it's very interesting to me. You know, I went through a, a lot of turmoil in my third and fourth year when I realized, you know, I don't really know what to do. <laughs> I don't know what specialty I want now. I based my whole life that I was going to do, you know, trauma surgery. And now I have no idea what I'm going to do. And I went through my rotations and I tried to figure out what I liked. And finally, I hit on something that just excited me. And it wasn't until my uh, fourth year. And I was uh, doing a dermatology rotation. I was doing a dermatopathology rotation at University of California, Davis. And it was like a light went off. It's like, this, this is it. This is it. I get to change people's lives. I cure cancer every day. I, you know, I, I get to do surgery and and I get to go home at five. <laughs> it was amazing. It was amazing. And, and pathology is fantastic because you get to use your brain every day. Um, it's always, you know, a, um, a puzzle. Yeah. And you really, it's, it's a very academic, educational sort of specialty. And dermatology is fantastic. You know, you get to change people's lives on a daily basis. And like I said, the work-life balance is unbeatable. So if, if you're talking to a pre-med student or, or maybe a medical student who's trying to figure this out, what would you tell them a dermatologist or, or even more specifically what a dermatopathologist does? A dermatopathologist, um, you can 
go through um, two different routes. You can do a dermatology residency, you can do a pathology residency, but then you do a fellowship in dramatic pathology. And exactly what you do is you look at slides from biopsies or excisions or something like that. Uh, and you look at the pathology under the microscope and you, you diagnose what the condition is, whether it's an inflammatory, like a rash, whether it's skin cancer, whether it's melanoma. And you t then tell the clinician exactly what the what the diagnosis is, and that really, I mean, that is the key to their treatment plan. So, if you diagnose melanoma on, on the slide, then you're also giving them, you know, the stage and the prognosis, that sort of thing, because there are certain um, characteristics on the slide that will determine, you know, the prognosis of that patient. And so as a pathologist, um, you are really the doctor's doctor. So they rely on you for treatment plan. They rely on you on prognos for prognosis, for staging, you know, these sort of things. And you really are behind the scenes um, unless you also practice clinical medicine, which is um, a lot of uh, dermatopathologists pathologists that are derm trained do that. Um, and that's, it's like a nice hybrid. You, you do both clinical and you do the pathology. Otherwise, a straight pathologist can really never be seen by the patient, but they are the most critical, one of the most critical, you know, parts to patient care, which a lot of people don't realize. But for me as a dermatopathologist, pathologist, um, I interpret the biopsies that I personally take as well as a lot of the dermatologists in my community will send me their biopsies because they trust that I know um, that I'm qualified and I know what to look for. A lot of people will send biopsies to say like some large lab where a general pathologist reads it and they may not get the correct diagnosis. So I get a lot of other dermatologists sending me things. Okay. And then I also see patients too. So describe a typical day for you. So typical day, I will uh, come in and I'll read my slides that came in from my biopsies um, from the day before. And so some of them are mine and some of them are outside of doctors. Uh, and then I will um, start my day usually around seeing patients, usually around 10 or so. And because I, I also do derm path, um, I don't have to see, you know, 30 patients or 40 patients in a day, which a lot of dermatologists will have to do in order to, you know, make their overhead. Um, so I get, to, I, I get, get to take a lot of time with my patients, and I see a wide range of patients. Every, everyone from young to old, rashes, skin cancer, um, cosmetic patients too. But I try to really uh, focus on medical dermatology patients. So um, ones that I can really make a difference. And I, one in particular always sticks out in my head when I first started my office earlier this year. I had a teenager um, who never wanted to look in the mirror because he had horrible acne. And so he covered his mirrors with a newspaper and he never left the house except to go to school. And um, basically over the course of about two or three months, I was able to just totally clear his skin and now he's like a new person. And that's why that like that's why I do it. I get to affect people's lives. I get to change how they see themselves and, and how they feel about about themselves. And and so that's you know, that's my typical day. I get to I get to really touch people's lives. Wow. Sounds great. What traits do you <laughs> think lead to being a good dermatopathologist? I think one of the most important things is to be very curious and also to um, think about all possibilities. So if you are sort of married to um, an idea, uh, you may not have the right diagnosis. So I've, I've seen this a couple of occasions where um, you may start looking at a slide and you have an idea of what you should be looking for. So then maybe you don't look for actually what's there. You sort of look for what you're trying to find and you miss something. So I always try to 
Um, I think like one of the most important things is to look at slides as if you're looking um, blindly. Like you, you want to look as if you don't have anything that's biasing you. Of course, you need to know the clinical history. You need to, you know, because a lot of it is clinical pathologic correlation. You need to know exactly what the history is. But I like to look at the slide first because you need to have an open mind. So that's a very important thing for all pathologists is to look at the slide um, and just just look at it and see what you can find and just be curious. Like, oh, what? I wonder what this is over here. What's this? You know, um, and don't be married to a particular idea. Um, that's very important in, in pathology. And then, of course, you correlate with the clinical later. But it's very important to start out with an open mind. And then, really, it a good pathologist will sort of know a lot of the differentials, and they'll um, kind of go down those paths of like, well, it could be this, it could be that. And and then they do certain tests and stains to figure out if that is indeed the case. And it's very important to think about all these differentials. So pathologists, you know, and there are so many different pathologists, you know, brain pathologists and and breast pathologists and, and GYN pathologists. Um, you really have to know so much clinical information because you have to know all the differential diagnoses that that particular entity could be on your slide. So it's very important to be good clinicians, even though you're pathologists and you don't really see patients that often. Um, so there's a couple of different, you know, things that you need to be. You need to be very curious. You need to um, know a lot of medicine as well, like clinical medicine. And you need to be open to, you know, different differential diagnoses and not be closed off. It's a lot of thinking in pathology, a lot of, of investigation, which is nice. Interesting. What makes a competitive applicant to dermatology first and then to dermatopathology as a fellowship? Yeah. Well, first off, dermatopathology is, is really tough to get into. Um, really, really tough because there aren't that many programs. And the programs that are around are, are very, very competitive. Uh, so it's probably even more competitive than dermatology. Um, there are a lot of dermatology programs and, and spots. Um, basically, with any sort of highly competitive specialty, you need to do a lot of research. You need to have papers. You need to have presentations. You know, go to national conferences and, and present, whether it's... Um, oral presentation or poster presentation. Um, if you have uh, novel research, that's fantastic. If you do a lot of um, uh, sub-I clinical you know, clerkships and um, they get to know you and they see you, um, then it's a lot easier to match into um, a competitive program. So I know a lot of people that did their sub eyes and uh, a lot of fourth year clerkships uh, for, you know, in dermatology and they're just, they're present. They're there every day. They do, you know, 110%. They go the extra mile. They're always, you know, doing something. They're giving little presentations. You know, they're always um, on their game. You know, they don't slack off. They're just, they're always there. And people see that. The attendings see that. They want someone who's going to be, you know, a thoughtful resident. They want someone who's hardworking. They want someone who's talented. I mean, if you have a aptitude for that, that particular field uh, and they know you and they trust you and they would like for you to be one of their residents, then obviously you're going to you're going to match there. So I always tell people do rotations in a place where you are really interested in doing your your residency and you think you really have a chance of of getting in um and the same thing for you know fellowship if you um really want to go to a particular derm path program you need to go there and do your rotation you need to ask if they have any research opportunities for you to um collaborate with and just go that extra mile no one's going to ask you to do these things. You have to take the initiative and do it. And it's tough. It takes a lot of effort. But if you're, if you're serious about it, then that's what you have to do. What was residency like? 
Residency was, was, was great. Um, I, uh, I was at university of Massachusetts and it was very, it was very tough <laughs> and it was, um, it was a, but it was a very good program, but, uh, it was a lot of work and, but you know what? It's, it's the people that you're with, your co-residents that make it worthwhile. You know, it's, it's like a big family and it's a team and you just, you just do it. And obviously it's not a surgery residency. You're not going to be awake for you know, how many hours a week and just work yourself crazy. But, um, it's, it's, you know, it's tough. Residency is, is tough especially if you're away from family and you're in a place where it snows constantly and maybe that's not what you're used to (laughs) growing up in California, but, um, but it was, it was fantastic. And then I stayed and I did my fellowship at the same place. So that was also nice because, um, you know, you know, you know, the system, you know, the people and you don't have to pick up and move somewhere. That's something I also tell a lot of people try to pick a program for residency, if, if you know you want to do a particular fellowship and that fellowship is very competitive, then um, try to pick your residency at the particular institution uh, where that fellowship is because you will most likely get the, get the fellowship because they know you. Mm-hmm. They know you. They're used to you. If you're doing a good job, they want to keep you. Um, and you have the most, you know, the most possibility of getting into that competitive fellowship if you do your residency there. Um, that's one of the reasons why I picked um, University of Massachusetts. Obviously, they're a great center, but I also knew that they were starting a brand new uh, Germanic pathology uh, fellowship. And that was that was my I knew I wanted to do that before I started. So that's why I went there mostly. Um, and I. Of course, my husband was in Massachusetts too, so I had to sort of match in that area. So okay. that was that was a, a big big bonus for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When uh, looking back now, what do you wish you knew going into dermatology and now d- dermatopathology? Oh, well, um, gosh, I wish that um, I wish that I had. I wish that I had known that it's it's possible. I know this is kind of a little bit off the topic of medicine, but I, I wish I knew that it was possible that you could have a family earlier on. So this is more for like um, maybe your female um, pre-meds and med students is that, you know, there's never a right time to have a family. And so when I started residency, I thought, oh my gosh, there's no way. We just keep waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And that's not probably that wasn't the best course of action and it's not necessary. So I wish I had known that you just live your life the way you want to live and there's not going to be a good time. And so your priorities should be family and then uh, residency and fellowship and all of that should be um, second. It's, it's, it's nice to sort of keep that in perspective. Um, It's easier said than done. I think a lot of people are like, no, this is my career. This is what I have to do. But you should not lose sight on um, your family. So family should have come first. And then you can always work hard and still be, you know, still have a family. But I'm not saying you slack off just because it's second. But I wish I hadn't put family on hold. Let's just say that. Okay. Yeah. What do you wish primary care providers knew more about dermatopathology? Oh, uh, <laughs> well, dermatology in general, yeah. I mean, I unfortunately I don't know why, but I I I feel that, that a lot of primary care physicians, um, they just have no no training for dermatology, and in general, most most specialties, and I I have to say even surgeons don't have a great grasp on what pathologists do in general. So here I am, I'm doing both. And so I get a lot of, a lot of um, referrals from primary care physicians where they've tried managing a, a derm condition. And it's, I, they, obviously they just, they just don't have the training. They don't know exactly what they, what 
what's going on and they've sort of mismanaged the patient for a while. Um, and then I also get, especially in training, so many um, specialties that had no idea what pathologists did. They thought pathology was just like a lab test and, and pathologists maybe aren't even real doctors. So they think they take a sample, a biopsy or something, and then it, it gets like a lab test, like a, like a blood test or something. And then you get the result, you know, a couple hours later. So they have no idea what pathologists in general do. So um, I sort of get it from both, both ends, both the clinicians for the dermatology and aren't, aren't quite sure what's going on. And I get, you know, doctors that just don't know what pathologists do. So a lot of my job is actually educating. So I, I try to educate my primary care physicians that refer to me. Um, some of them like to take their own biopsies. So I, I've gone to their offices and actually give them little lectures about, you know, these are common skin conditions. This is, this is, um, you know, this is what this is, and this is how you biopsy, uh, and then what a biopsy is. You know, what does that mean? What happens to that piece of tissue after you take it, and how I make a diagnosis? So um, it, a lot of my job is actually educating, but I wish that primary care physicians would get more of a, a background in dermatology. Um, mostly they just try to, you know, throw some cortisone on it and then think that it's going to be okay. <laughs> it's not, that's not what dermatology is all if about. If it's wet, keep it dry. Uh, if it's dry, keep it wet. <laughs> and when in doubt, cut it out. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's not, unfortunately, that's not um, the way it, go yeah. it goes. But for the most part, it works out, except when they overlook something like a melanoma and they think that it's nothing. And I've had that happen many times where they think that it's, you know, oh, this is fine, this is fine, and then the patient comes to me, and now they have, you know, a high-stage melanoma because it's been missed. And that, you know, all, all joking aside, that's that's what I'm trying to prevent. Mm. It's okay if you want to mismanage a rash for, you know, several months, but um, when you miss a melanoma and you tell the patient, oh, it's nothing, um, then that's where we run into problems. Okay. That's when people die. So, yeah, I wish they got more training. Okay. So I'm assuming it's it's primary care providers and other dermatologists that you work closely with the most. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Okay. What do you like mm -hmm. the most about being a dermatopathologist? Oh, honestly, I love um, the intellectual stimulation, I have to say. I love looking at slides and figuring out what the diagnosis is. And I love, I also love talking to patients. I love interacting with patients and um, uh, uh, about skin. I love talking to them about their skin. I'm not, I am not a general practitioner. I am not going to talk to you about your diabetes. You know, that's like just way too much. But I love sitting down and talking to them because a lot of the times we just start talking about you know, whatever, like what they did last weekend or whatever. And then I just get to know them. Um, you know, they send me cards, they send me flowers, whatever. And I, I, you know, I take care of their skin and that's, I make them look good. I make them feel good. I, I give them healthy skin and I love that aspect. So I, I love this sort of dichotomy where I see the patients, I take care of them, I interact with them. And then I also have this like intellectual stimulation by looking at the slides and, and figuring out their diagnoses, and you know, I, I love that dichotomy in my in my practice. That's my favorite thing. And then of course, I get to do surgery too, which is I love surgery, um, and I love starting my morning off, you know, cutting out skin cancer, and that's you know, that's a huge rush for me. I, I just cured your cancer. That's awesome. Who can say that on a daily basis, that right? Is, that is pretty cool. That's fantastic. <laughs> on, on the flip side, what do you like the least? Oh, I mean, hands down, dealing with insurance companies. There's, I mean, I mean, I don't like being told that I can't prescribe a certain medication for a patient or that, you know, um, the patient's out of my network, therefore they have to pay a lot of money or um, their deductible is high that 
they're going to have to pay out of pocket for their um, biopsy that I just did. I, I can't, I can't stand, I can't stand this sort of thing. It really gets in the way of um, patient care and, and I don't really see a way out of it. Um, but that's hands down dealing with insurance, dealing with the sort of, you know, the sort of thing is, it's really a headache and I don't actually have to deal with it as much as other specialties when they, they really, you know, prior authorizations for something as simple as like a, you know, topical steroid is just insane. Mm. It's ridiculous. So that's the least favorite. And especially being on my own, a solo practitioner, and I do everything myself. So I don't have staff that's going to be doing that sort of stuff for me. So so that's that's also kind of a big headache. I think it's safe to say that if you had to do it all over again, you would choose the same specialty? Oh, yeah. Definitely. There's, I don't see myself doing anything else. You know, once in a while I get these sort of twinges of like, oh, I wonder what it would have been like to have been a trauma surgeon in the hospital, some big shot. And then it's like, well, yeah, but I get to go home to my family and, and two little girls at five o'clock. Yeah. And, and, I'm, and I'm super happy about that. And I love my patients and I love what I do. What do you see as so, the future of dermatopathology? It's a little bit scary. I feel like um, a lot of clinicians don't realize that the interpretations that they get from these big laboratories are not done by experts. And so I really feel that the specialty as a whole is a a bit under pressure to make themselves more noticeable to people and, and make it such that clinicians understand that they should have their biopsies interpreted by experts in the field instead of big box general pathologists who may not give the correct diagnoses. And I feel that it's all about money. So it's obviously cheaper for them, you know, a big lab to have, you know, a ton of um, general pathologist reading slides than it is to have like an expert, you know, derm path read it. So I feel like that's um, that's something that we really have to stress, that it's it's not about money, it's about patient care and what's the best thing. And I've seen a lot of misdiagnosed uh slides and misdiagnosed melanoma, this and that from general pathologists from these big labs. And that's a problem for patient care, but obviously for bottom line, for money, for the insurance companies, you know, that's, it's, uh, it's cheaper for them. Right. So that's like a big thing for derm paths. And I think there are also a lot of programs that are trying to start, you know, have more derm path spots. And so if you have more derm path spots, then, um, obviously you saturate the field because one derm path can read, you know, hundreds of biopsies a day. Um, so if you saturate the field and, you know, supply and demand, right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, that's a problem. And you may not get the best people training because you're trying to get as many out there as possible. Not everyone can do this job and not everyone should do this job. There are a lot of issues with derm path. Um, but as a whole, as of right now, I think it's still a great field. It's a great field to go into. Any last words of wisdom for those wanting to be or thinking about becoming a dermatopathologist? I think that um, one of the main things you should be thinking of um, is not money. It should be work-life balance. Um, You need to be happy in the specialty you pick. And dermatopathology and dermatology... um, There are two fields where, you know, you will do well, whether you are a solo practitioner or you're in a group, you will do well, you know, money wise. And you're not going to make like a crazy amount of money. So those days are over. Um, But you're going to have a good um, work life balance, which I think should be one of the most, you know, important things when you consider going into a field like which field to go into. I think that's super important. Um, so, and I think, you know, those two specialties, derm and derm path will offer that. They'll, they'll give you a good quality of life. They'll give you a good work life balance, um, and a good pay. And that's, that should be what you're looking for. This is not, this is not an altruistic, um, profession. You have, it, it is still a business and people lose sight of that. 
you have to pick a specialty that you're going to do well in and that you're going to be happy with. So that's episode one in the books. If you have a specialty that you really want me to cover sooner rather than later, and you know a physician that you think would make a great guest on this podcast, shoot me an email, ryan at medicalschoolhq.net. That's our main website, medicalschoolhq.net. You can find everything that we do there. You can find a list of all the podcasts that we do over at mededmedia.com. Again, I, that's the network of all of the podcasts that we're doing. Specialty Stories is now our fourth podcast, which is uh, awesome and fun and crazy. So I, I hope you learned something today. I know not all of you are interested in dermatopathology or even dermatology or pathology separately, but understanding what other physicians are doing, I think, is key to teamwork, which is what what everything I do is based on, uh, at collaboration, not competition, and understanding what these other specialists are doing and how you can make their job easier so that they can give you the information that you need to make your job easier, I think is going to be key in the long run. So I hope I get the information out to you that you need, that you want to help you make the decisions so that as you are going through your pre-med journey, you're shadowing the types of physicians maybe you hear on here. As a medical student, you're rotating and and picking sub-eyes based on awesome specialists and specialties that you hear on this podcast. And when it comes to matching, I hope that this podcast will help you make that decision much easier. So I hope this podcast has helped you in that journey and we will be back hopefully next week with another episode here at the specialty stories in the meantime go check out all the other podcasts that we're doing over at mededmedia.com thanks for joining me on this first episode of the specialty stories